All right, chapter 25 covers the pathogenic RNA viruses. We are not going to attempt to cover all the viruses. We're going to select some of the RNA viruses. There were many I could have chosen, but this is the list that I have prepared. Some of the viruses have alternate names and you need to know those as well, but the names and symptoms of these diseases, and in some cases, little special things that go along with certain diseases. So um, maybe make a chart to help you summarize the information on each disease. But these are all RNA viruses, and we are going to talk a bit about, especially for flu, influenza um, particularly, something called antigenic drift and antigenic shift because this is what creates the new variants that come around the world every year. So similar mechanisms are in place for other disorders, I mean other viruses I should say, um, but the flu in particular um, has some special features that allow something called antigenic drift and antigenic shift especially. So this is the, these are the viruses that we're going to study. West Nile, and I've kind of color coded them to help keep track of which slides go with which virus. And then two types of measles. One is called red measles or sometimes just measles. The other one is called German measles. Sometimes it's called rubella. Um, and so two things that both have the name measles in them, but they are in, in a lot of ways very different in terms of severity. Um, and then RSV, that's respiratory syncytial virus, a fairly common virus. Rabies, not common, but um, ser very serious. A lot of these can be very serious, to be honest, in flu or influenza. So we're going to start with um, a zoonose, which means an animal disease that's spread to humans usually through a vector, meaning uh, a mosquito or some type of arthropod often can do this. Um, one thing about a zoonose is that it is typically not passed, once a human gets it, it's typically not passed from that human directly to another human. So each human has to get it from a separate mosquito bite um, that carries it from an animal. And so West Nile virus, we're fairly familiar with this in the Dallas area. And you are probably familiar with the trucks that come through every once in a while to spray for mosquitoes. Um, and that's really a made an attempt to keep the level of mosquitoes and the amount of West Nile virus under control. Not, um, there's not really any hope of it completely eliminating it. But it came to the U.S. in 1999. It's classified as a flavivirus, um, but we're not going to go too deep into classification, so you don't need to worry about that too much. It is asymptomatic in most cases. And so that's the good news. And also, like I said, humans are not going to be a reservoir of this virus because humans are kind of a dead end to transmission. So a lot of people might get infected with this virus from mosquito bite, but most of us won't really have any symptoms or might have something very mild that you might not even pay much attention to. However, the risk is for some reason, some people do get severe cases, and what it results in is encephalitis, which is a particular kind of inflammation of, in the brain. So it, that can be very dangerous. Fortunately, it doesn't occur very often, but it can lead to death. So it's considered a neuroinvasive infection. Anything to do with the brain is neurological. And so in this, uh, you don't have to memorize the epidemiology, but I'd like to show you the reported cases. And you'll recall the nationally notifiable um, diseases. So West Nile virus is um, 
on that list. Now, these are just the reported cases. In other words, people who actually had some symptoms went to the doctor and got tested, really. So there's plenty of cases that are asymptomatic that don't get counted. So keep that in mind. But of the ones that did get reported, you see these peaks. And the peaks come very regularly every year. And it comes when there's the right temperature, outdoor temperature, and the right amount of rain to, to cause the mosquito population to grow. And, and so really we're talking about like summer. I mean, this can be like four to five months of the year when the mosquitoes are bad. But you see these peaks. You do get some, you do get a break in the middle of winter when it's too cold and too dry for mosquitoes. But in any case, some years are worse than others with cases. Um, however, you do see this peak that comes sort of at the end of each cycle of deaths. And that's shown in blue. So the cases and then the deaths. So um, for those people who do get the bad symptoms, it can lead to death. All right, moving on. Rubella. Another name for rubella is German measles. And the reason it's called German measles is, um, I think it's, it, hap it was first maybe identified in somebody who is German. Um, rubella is more of the scientific name of it. And it's a pretty short um, disease course. It starts in the respiratory system, but it spreads throughout the body and it's an RNA virus, like I said. It's characterized by flat pink or red spots, no pus, nothing um, coming out of the spots, just a rash, and it pretty much covers the body. Um, infections in children are not serious. It is typically considered kind of a childhood disease. The main risk would be Typical for any disease, the main risk is typically in pregnant women, um, people who have um, compromised immune systems, for example. And in this case, an infection of a pregnant woman can cause defects, birth defects in the, in the unborn fetus. However, we have vaccination and most people do get the vaccination. The vaccination is part of what we call the MMR vaccine, MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella. So the rubella, the R of MMR refers to rubella, which is the German measles. The other kind of measles, the M in MMR, the first M stands for measles, and that means red measles. Unfortunately, the name for red measles, the scientific uh, name is rubiola. And rubiola is the more dangerous kind of measles. It's not the same as rubella. So rubella is the German measles, three day measles. It's just not a very, not considered a serious disease, except like I said, in pregnant women, but for most people, not much of anything. Rubiola, however, is much more serious. And what you can see here in this chart, I'll move my picture around. What you can see here is the first line here in the table, it says measles, also known as rubiola and red measles. Both diseases, red measles and German measles are common to children. So they are considered childhood diseases. They're pretty, they, they don't happen as much anymore because of the MMR vaccine. But you can see the complications for um, a child with red measles includes pneumonia, encephalitis, and panencephalitis. So we are talking about lung and, and brain swelling type uh, complications, which are very dangerous. For German measles, not much of anything other than um, birth defects for an unborn fetus. So it's a wildly different um, risk factor. In terms of the rash, I, it says extensive versus mild. Um, I don't know that you can tell too much by the rash, but something that is distinguishing is something called the couplet spots in the mouth. Red measles, you have these in the mouth. So if you look under the tongue, and this is a close-up under the tongue, and this is one of those 
um, wooden sticks, the tug depressors that they use. And you can see these whitish spots in the tissue. So it's um, that's considered diagnostic for uh, red measles. Again, here's a child with red measles, but again, I don't know that the rash itself is very telling. The cases of red measles dropped significantly once the um, vaccine came out, the MMR vaccine. Although recently, as, as recently as 2014, we see numbers getting back to the pre-vaccine levels. And we think, although there's research being done, but we think it's because the certain anti-vaxxers have been able to convince enough people not to vaccinate their children that we may start seeing numbers again. But I don't have any data after 2014, so I would need to follow up with that. But this is what your book is showing you. So the MMR vaccine is very effective if it's used. So people who get red measles now are those who were not immunized primarily. All right, respiratory syncytial virus. This is called RSV, and what it does is it causes the fusion of lung cells. So the virus infects lung cells deep down in what we call the lower respiratory tract, and it causes those lung cells to fuse together. When lung cells are fused together, you have less surface area for gas diffusion, and that means you have difficulty breathing. And this is a fatal respiratory disease for infants and children. It's actually quite common. Um, I'm not saying it's always fatal, but getting RSV is not that uncommon for infants. Um, and so it should be taken very seriously. In older children and adults, it probably shows up either asymptomatic or seems like just a cold. But it's really, really dangerous for a baby. This picture just shows what we call syncytium is just a fusion of cells. It's not the best um, illustration I've ever seen, but in this top part, you're supposed to be seeing multiple cells and some of them are infected and you can see that the cell membranes are fusing together. So you get this massive clump of cells that are no longer individually separated by plasma membranes. And all, overall, what that means is that you get, um, you have less surface area for gas diffusion. So less uh, more difficulty in breathing. So that can be very dangerous and it's, um, you know, there can be long-term damage there. All right, rabies. Rabies is caused